Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Nzinga, and um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Pro Intersectional Vegan Conference. Uh, our first Skype speaker is Dr. Breeze Harper. Uh, Dr. Harper has been invited to deliver many keynote addresses and lectures at universities and conferences throughout North America. In 2016, her lecture workshop circuit focused on uprooting white fragility and the post-racial ethical foodscape, which is part of her new book project, Recipes for Racial Tension Headaches, A Critical Race Feminist Journey Through the Post-Racial U.S. Ethical Foodscape. Dr. Harper's most recently published book, Scars, A Black Lesbian Experience in Rural White New England, interrogates how systems of oppression and power impact the life of the only black teenager living in an all-white work, uh, all working class rural New England town. Can we please give a round of applause for Dr. Harper? Hi, good morning everyone. Um, sorry I can't be there. Um, can you hear me just fine or is there a reverb? We can hear you. Okay, great. So I'm um, just saying, I sorry I can't be there in person. I'm actually going to go into labor any day. So my midwife thought it wasn't a good idea to fly out. Um, but I'm here through the miracle of technology. And I um, just wanted to give a disclaimer. It's 3 in the morning where I am right now. So I've never actually given a talk at 3 in the morning. So even though I have something prepared, um, my brain may be a little slower than usual if it were like, you know, the sun were out. So I um, just wanted to give that as a, <laughs> as a warning. Um, but thank you for coming to attend my talk. And um, this talk is actually based on the book that I'm writing right now, uh, Recipes for Racial Tension Headaches. It's the tentative title. Uh, but it's a critical race feminist journey through the post-racial ethical foodscape of the United States. Um, so to give you some background on what I'm doing, why I've decided to do this book project, um, is that uh, by training, I'm a critical race feminist, and I'm a materialist. Um, so I did my research at UC Davis focusing on how food objects can tell us about the racial caste system in the USA. So the meanings that human beings have applied to food objects, whether it be a cookbook or the way someone's interpreted a new vegan food item, it can tell us a lot about how the racial class system works in the USA. Um, and then as a critical race feminist, basically it's a very intersectional approach to understanding these hierarchies of power, but not through this one-dimensional fra framing, but um, it seeks to understand how society organizes itself along intersections of race, gender, and class, and other forms of social hierarchies. Um, and it utilizes counter story as a methodology and legitimizes the voices of women of color in speaking about social. Politics. So, um, who's ever moderating, if you can go to that next slide so we can have definitions. And um, with my work, I'm interested in this concept of the foodscape. So the foodscape emphasizes the spatialization of foodways, the interconnections between people, food, and places. And foodscape is drawn from the concept landscape. It is a term used to describe a process of viewing place in which food is used as a lens to bring into focus selected human relations. So what does all that mean? Um, basically, in a nutshell, I'm just really interested in ethical consumption and more uh, veganism over the past 10 years. And um, if someone can just jump to the next slide. Um, I've decided to create kind of my own studies to understand um, how cultural food studies and cultural um, ethical studies and critical race feminism can kind of be combined to start interrogating um, systems of oppression. So um, I call it critical race feminist cultural food studies. And this centralizes, A, how human relations are shaped by the white racial caste system, 
plus neoliberal capitalist systems, and B, how these affected relations socially, economically, politically, and geographically shape not just the ethical USA foodscape, but the food system and food culture in general. And over the past year, I've been really asking such questions as how does black rage and white fragility shape ethical foodscape? Um, and then um, this conference is about intersectionality, which I've been doing since I was 19, but didn't realize there was a word for it until I entered academia and, and um, discovered Kimberly Crenshaw. So what I engage is in an intersectional anti-racism. It's dismantling racism as a system with the understanding that we must not perpetuate other systems of oppression and recognize that race does not exist in a vacuum. So to understand racism, you have to understand sexism, you have to understand ageism, ableism, transphobia, so it's all connected, and that's what I, 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 I do when I talk about intersectional anti-racism. At the center of my interests um, are understanding how racism affects people systemically, structurally, institutionally, visually, but also I know that there's connections to the other isms, so that's how I approach it. Um, so what I wanted to do is um, share with you what my upcoming book is going to talk about. So if someone can go to the next slide, Sister Vegan. Um, for those of you who may not know, uh, one of the reasons that I am interested in ethical consumption and, and part of veganism and intersectionality is that about, it's been probably more than 10 years ago um, when I transitioned into veganism, I realized that I was living in Boston, Cambridge, USA, Massachusetts, and I had never actually met um, any black identified vegans. Most of the vegans I had met were white, and the reasons for them becoming vegan were because of animal rights. And at the same time, I was um, attending Harvard and learning more about black feminisms and was curious um, how racial formation, racialization, and gender in the USA potentially affect why someone decides to engage in the ethical consumption practices that they did. So I actually did a call for papers um, looking for the voices of Black identified female vegans and wondering if I can get a collection of voices that really talk about how race and gender have actually affected why they've transitioned into veganism. And um, that was not the most interesting part of the, the call for papers. The most interesting part of the call for papers is that it went to a website called Vegan Porn where someone posted the call for papers. And it wasn't actually about porn, it was everything vegan. But the reception of that call for papers actually piqued my interest. The moderator posted the call for papers and there were days and days of comments from mostly white vegans that literally did not understand how race and gender could actually have anything to do with veganism. Um, and this piqued my interest because I didn't actually participate, I just looked at it. There are a plethora of comments ranging from people critiquing the use of SISTA and saying that if you sound like you've been born to a crack addicted mother, you don't basically deserve to be employed. Um, to people critiquing that um, race is not an issue and why would we bring this up? So I found that interesting and I spoke to my master's um, thesis advisor about this. I had been doing Java development before and I wasn't really interested as much as kind of diving into why these comments were happening. So I turned um, all that empirical evidence, all those comments into a master's thesis um, to really interrogate what uh, covert whiteness looks like within the ethnic food system. So at that time, uh, there was a lot of work already being done in what uh, systemic racism and overt whiteness look like over the internet. My focus was educational technology, kind of looking at cyberspace and consumption. But no one had actually focused on well, what is covert whiteness, you know, this vegan porn site, where there's a plethora of white identified vegans who sincerely don't believe that they're contributing to systemic racism and that they're good people because they don't exploit animals. Um, so that ended up becoming 
my uh, master's thesis work really showing what that looks like and how that unfolds. And I thought that was really important since um, most people, at least in the U.S. today, they have what I would consider 1950s or 1960s um, literacy around race and racialization, and that they're still kind of stuck in the civil rights era of understanding what racism is. So when they engage in it in a covert way, particularly white people, they really don't even know that that's what they're doing. So um, I became interested in the ethical food scene and how racial formation, racialization, and systemic racism have shaped that um, ever since I did that kind of call for papers and got those, those very, um, I guess, covertly racist comments from mostly white vegans who understand the concept of this project. Um, so what this means for me is that when I get a lot of comments, probably in the last 12 years about the work that I'm doing, that this book and the, the comments that I've gathered from people who are white identified vegans and still in denial about the significance of racism in this country, USA, um, and then even more so in how they come to their vegan practices, um, I've seen a theme pattern over the last 12 years of what um, Professor Robin D'Angelo coins white fragility. So over the past one and a half years, I've been really interested in shifting my focus to um, responding to white fragility, which basically in a nutshell, at least in the USA context, white fragility is when white identified people go through all these different defense mechanisms to not want to talk about the obvious or what is obvious to people of color in the United States, that the supremacist racial caste system over the last 500 years has had profoundly negative effects on every aspect of life, including even ethical consumption, veganism, animal rights. Um, so these are the things that I'm really focused on and giving workshops and lectures about um, how to uproot white fragility in the ethical food system. Um, so over the last, I think, year and a half, I've been going to universities um, throughout North America to talk about, you know, what does it mean to kind of uproot white fragility when white identified people start thinking that there is a systemic racism problem and they start kind of trying to, you know, diverge to another topic or see that race is not a significant impediment. Um, and then I also offer talks about uh, how to engage in intersectional anti-racism. Um, so one of the little vignette stories I wanted to share, I think it's important that not to just focus on ethical foodscape, but how um, systemic racism kind of affects, at least in the United States, everything. Um, so if someone can go to the next slide. Is there a picture of food up? Make sure we're on the same side. Yeah. Yes? Okay. Um, so I did this little cartoon like four years ago. And I'll read it for those who um, maybe sight and, and not be able to see it. So if Buddha were born 50 years ago and raised in the USA as a brown man and experienced suffering from the violence of ongoing structural racism and white supremacy, well into 2012, would he consider post-racial Buddhists to be mindful or deliberate? Um, so I wrote this um, little cartoon after I decided to take one of my many travels to um, a Buddhist Sangha. I practice um, Buddhism, a Buddhist Sangha in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and I ended up at Green Gulch Zen Center, where my family and I, we, we go all the time. Um, and the Zen Center is well known for growing their own food, and they're really focused on offering um, almost exclusively just vegan food for those that visit and for the people who are living there um, as um, monks and nuns. So I thought this was an interesting experience for me um, because the place is it's mostly white, and those that actually give money or donations to it are largely white, wealthier San Francisco Bay Area people. Um, and during one of my talks over a nice vegan meal with um, good intentioned white people, 
um, I was with an Asian identified woman and we were talking about race and we were talking about how racism is still a problem in this country. And um, the white identified person that was sitting with us, we considered herself to be very mindful because she doesn't eat animals and she practices in Buddhism, immediately decided to dismiss our concerns about race and said that racism would be such a problem if this Asian woman and I were not so um, hung up on using labels, racial labels to identify ourselves. And um, I don't know how many people are familiar with Buddhism, but um, there's this concept of being mindful and not being deluded. So I experienced this person, this white identified woman, as being deluded by suggesting that it's as simple as just removing a racial label and then people of color in the United States would fare better and there'd be more equality. Um, and that I had asked myself, is this mindfulness or this delusion? And I had been thinking, well, if I think about it, if Buddha himself had existed, you know, 50 years ago to the present, he is a brown man in the USA, I think going through this embodied experience as a brown man in the USA, he would probably feel that this woman was being deluded. Um, and I, I was wondering to myself, I wonder also, you know, how to navigate these spaces and how he would navigate these spaces, um, where there are good willing white people who are sitting in these spaces where there's locally raised um, plants for them and that they're not eating animals. So we don't have to think further about race. Um, so I had put this comic together and it's going to be a chapter in my book, um, just about not just like ethical landscape, but also how um, a lot of these concepts of covert whiteness, white fragility, um, are found in spaces like mostly white Buddhist spaces, where the intention for the community there is to actually be mindful, but mindful in a way that still dismisses or denies uh, the significance of white supremacy in the West Side. Can someone go to the next slide? Um, and um, a lot of the work that I've been doing for the last, I guess, 20 years now, um, I have gotten a lot of great support, uh, but I also still to get, get this type of white virginity and um, denial about the work that I'm doing. So a few months ago, I created a, a, a little cartoon that um, reflects how I often feel when I go and I give talks in predominantly white areas in the United States, or someone goes onto my blog and reads one of my articles that critiques whiteness systemically and institutionally, not really actually attacking individual white people, which is a very big difference. So this comic about um, has uh, me, the cartoon character, saying, I have a PhD in critical studies of race and food, and today I'll be talking about how the USA racial practice affects ethical consumption philosophies. And I've gotten all different types of uh, responses, but I did um, put in a few form of um, bubbles and cartoons. So the first one says, I don't like how she defines racism. It's different than the one in the Webster Dictionary. Um, so as I'm doing this work in ethical foodscape and trying to understand, like, get the majority of white people to understand what racism is, um, many times they fall to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary definition. Um, versus definitions that are very holistic and ever-changing and more complex that you can find in the canon of critical studies of race. So um, this is kind of one of those deflection methods um, that a lot of white people use, and that they'll go right to the Merriam tradition. And I thought this was something really important to share because you have to understand the, the like, socio-historical context of creating a dictionary and who's behind it, and that the dictionary itself is that it's an object. It reflects gender and class and racial hierarchies of power of the time it was written. So the Merriam-Webster Dictionary was written by mostly white gender men, and their embodied experiences would probably help them produce definitions such as racism. So it's really important for a lot of white people who just use that dictionary to understand that there's that's huge problematic in comparison to the rich canon of critical race studies that has definitions of racism changing throughout time and how you know it, it operated 400 years ago, it's not the same as 200 years ago, 
versus 20 years ago or 14 years ago. Um, another comment, the second one is, what? She must be a white hating racist if she thinks eating ethically has anything to do with race. So um, again, this, this, this theme where when I go in as someone trained to understand systems of oppression and focusing on race and white supremacy, a lot of white identified people in the USA immediately think I'm talking about individual white people versus ideologies um, and practices that are that um, is centralized in, in whiteness and white normativity, white supremacy. Um, so I've spent a lot of time trying to delineate between the difference of, well, this is something I'm doing as a scholar and I'm looking at systems versus just attacking individual white people. So there doesn't seem to be a high level of literacy for this demographic collectively to understand that when people like myself are critiquing that we're not actually focusing on individuals, but focusing on systems. And that, um, you know, whether you think you're a well-intentioned white person or not, just being in a system that benefits whiteness means that by default you're going to benefit. It doesn't matter if you try not to or not, you're going to benefit. Um, and to counter a lot of these, um, I've used my own privileges as a cisgender woman to really talk about how this is not about individual bashing someone, but understanding a system. And um, I found it very useful to talk about how, even though I am not transphobic overtly, I'm not cis sexist overtly, being a cisgender woman, a consciousness that has been formed through that experience for few years, I still am in collusion with it, and I'll never be in the end where I'm not, just how it is. You know, I, I'm always aware of it, the past that I can be, but I'm still going to benefit from it. So I found using those analogies very helpful when I'm trying to talk about intersectionality, trying to discuss with mostly white people in the ethical foodscape um, that this is not about individual white hating, this is about systems. This is about structures and institutions. And I find it very useful for me to use my own privileges um, as a way to kind of show that, you know, I'm not attacking the individual, that this is this is bigger than you think, and even if you're well-intentioned by people, if you're part of a privileged demographic, the system is going to privilege you. You may not even notice it. And then lastly, it was kind of the same. The person says she sounds like a bigot. Um, so I think, was it probably about a year and a half ago, um, someone who is very well-known in the um, animal rights and abolition movement um, decided that um, he would label me as a bigot because of the type of work that I'm doing. Um, and I found this really interesting because he is a white identified man, the professor, and has a lot of clout. And the work that I was doing um, seemed to really rattle him, really upset him. Um, and over the past year and a half, um, he's been basically engaging in this type of um, discursive violence against the work I've been doing by saying, um, that I'm basically a bigot. And I found that really interesting because it, once again, it kind of shuts down the conversation um, of what intersectionality can look like among women of color who are vegans and taking an approach that may not be exactly the way the mainstream, like white, male, masculinist, animal rights um, collective have been doing. Um, so it's kind of helped me try to figure out how to up my game and have these conversations and um, not do the type of eye for eye that a lot of people do when they are deeply hurt by um, people who don't agree with them. But it's allowed me to really step up my game as an intersectional anti-racist to really understand ritual rage that come from even those who are considered groups in the movement um, about the work that they do. Um, so one of the things that I want to share with the audience that a lot of times if you're doing really hard work as a person who's marginalized, and then you get a lot of hateful um, responses or people attacking you. That for me, I don't do the eye for eye thing. What I actually do is try to understand um, the surface of the anger and the fear, the vitriol, um, and then try to turn that around as ways to create better ways to learn and connect with each other if we initially think that we don't have anything in common. So over the past year and a half, um, the continuation of this person always having to 
remind people who follow him that Bryce Harper is a white hating bigot, um, is that that has allowed me to kind of grow my practice and um, try to figure out how I can better connect with those who instantly kind of engage in white fragility and really think that the type of work that I'm doing means I must be a white hating racist or a bigot. Um, as someone who's a vegan or not, you know, just even beyond that. Um, so speaking of that, um, someone can move to the next slide. I appreciate that. Okay, um, so we're talking about white fragility, and I don't know how many people are familiar with um, the work of Joel Salatin. Um, but about a year and a half ago, I was on a conf listserv and um, after my experience with this listserv I decided to put this pretend, um, this pretend uh, picture up so I don't know if someone's on the next slide where it says local and farm fresh do people see that those who are able site able okay um, so I wrote this little pretend ad after I had a um, experience with a kung fu listserv which has thousands of members, um, really focused on like local, organic, um, mostly animal um, agriculture. So someone had posted that um, Joel Salatin would be a judge for a solo contest. And um, if people are familiar with Joel Salatin and uh, how he frames uh, sustainable and food, um, that the way he frames it is, in my opinion, it's kind of rooted in racism and it's very masculinist, it's sexist, it's really xenophobic. So I'm not saying he himself is a bad person, but the way he frames ethical consumption um, is rooted in a lot of these isms. Um, so I did respond to that contest email and ask, um, you know, how can the contestants be assured that they'll be judged fairly um, if they're not a white man. And, you know, how will uh, Salatin framing of food and sustainability, which we've seen in a lot of um, critiques of, of public benefit, which is, like I said, um, framed through racism and whiteness and masculinity and um, sexism, uh, how can we be assured that soil consumption uh, will, be try uh, will be looked at fairly? Um, and that actually garnered a lot of resistance and a lot of um, anger from people who thought uh, I was individually attacking one person um, versus critiquing how one frames food and sustainability. And uh, the most interesting part of this for me uh, was that I was um, written by many people who thought that I was just trying to be divisive. Um, I didn't get a lot of support over what I had questioned um, publicly. But privately, um, quite a few people did email me saying that they had voiced that same type of concern. Uh, but the difference was that they were not um, comfortable enough with sharing with me publicly or sharing publicly that they did agree. Um, so for me, I found that really puzzling that you know, what is one's responsibility um, when you know that something is unethical um, and that you know certain is are still being perpetuated? Uh, what is your responsibility for your role of um, kind of overcoming your fear and being mindful of, I guess, um, how safe you can be when you actually come out publicly and start saying, yeah, actually, that is a problem, even though I don't want to attack this person as an individual how they frame this or how they do this, um, they actually have negative effects on both humans and non-human animals. Um, so, um, what had happened was that um, someone from a, a Food Sustainability Institute privately emailed me, and they were a self-identified white man. Um, and he was like incredibly distraught by what I had publicly asked or stated about Joel Salatin. And he explained to me that he knows Salatin quite well and that they have had heated and spirited disagreements, but that Salatin has never used quote unquote bigoted language before. 
And I was disappointed because the comment came across as such that to uphold racist and sexist systems simply means one calls a black person quote unquote nigger or calls a woman quote unquote cunt. Hence, since Salad doesn't use this type of language publicly, he is clearly not racist. And then this person, who is a white identified man, he asked that I provide evidence. So I provided him with like four citations that were hyperlinked to full documents, and these included a dissertation and three peer-reviewed social science-based papers. And then he explained to me that he didn't have time to look through all these documents and that I should draw out several quotes to substantiate my claim. So my logic is that it doesn't make sense to pull a quote out of context. So reading the full document would allow people to draw their own conclusions. So I kindly asked him to do the work himself. Um, so, you know, I was wondering, is he distraught over the possibility that the company one keeps says a lot about him as a person? And it's difficult to find out that a friend you consider close could maybe be a little racist or a little sexist, et cetera. But at the same time, I also didn't understand how my initial question created such a huge uproar. Um, and in addition, like I said, I did get a lot of private emails from people who totally agree with my questions. They were privately emailed. They did not write it publicly on Twitter. And that I can tell only one other person, a black woman, did publicly support my concerns on Kamalu. So it would only seem that me, this other black identified anti racist, racist food and sustainability woman, were in agreement publicly. So I guess my question to the audience would be like, what do you think people are so scared of? Why is it so problematic for most to publicly respond? that they have the same concerns as I do about Salatin or anyone else's framing of food and sustainability that could potentially maintain and uphold not just racism, but sexism, xenophobia, um, ableism, and transphobia. So is the mainstream food and sustainability movement so powerful that one is not supposed to mess with them publicly, or they'll destroy you, at least in the context of the USA? So um, I found that a little disconcerting. And I think for me, the conversation was really intense last week. And um, I started realizing that I myself was disturbed because people don't understand what it means that someone frames something in a way that has um, racist consequences. They don't have to actually have that as the intention, but the impact more concerned about. Um, and I thought it was a valid point because um, my concern is that if someone has a viewpoint, it could perpetuate systems of oppression unconsciously or consciously. Um, and as a mom of three very young black children, I've been thinking a lot of my responsibility of pointing out when very influential figures in food and beyond have perspectives that uphold isms, racism, white supremacy, sexism, that at least the USA was founded on. And I had been thinking a lot about how certain people will take negative ideas and build on them. So maybe they were at an event and heard someone like um, Salatin um, imply that those who are best at doing food and sustainability are white, cisgender, straight men. Um, and maybe they're at an event which um, he has, um, has implied. Um, and Salatin has implied also that he's not interested in working class black mob urban areas that are struggling um, to put food on their table. Like he's just said that I'm really more focused on white middle class upper class. So what happens when you're at an event like this, this white guru man saying these things? So when you hear this, are, are they planting seeds in the minds of mostly white people? who don't have a critical race literacy for post-2000 age to begin with. So the mainstream good movement, they don't want to hear this, but seriously, if these things are not nipped in the butter or called out, it could produce the next Dylan Roof. So for those of you who are not familiar with Dylan Roof, he is the um, young white man who opened fire on black church members in 
South, uh, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina last year. And it was totally because of his white supremacist ideas about black people, a hate crime. So even if, you know, it's not the intention for someone to frame something in a systemically racist or sexist way, that when they do this without understanding it, the seeds are planted. Um, and what I basically learned that most of the Kham food also, the members there, are not vegetarian, they're not vegan. So a lot of them um, were very, very clear in supporting local and sustainable ways of eating that um, exploit animals and animal byproducts. So when I cited an article that critiqued Salatin's framework that also critiqued local tourism, people also seemed quite irritated with that. I had provided a paper to point out the critique along the lines of race and gender, then I realized it would irritate some folk that it was also critiquing the eating of animals. So one of the best articles I read that critiqued Salatin is this article called The Celebrity of Salatin. Can a famous lunatic farmer change the food system? So it couldn't get any more concrete than that, the problems with this sexist and white conservative libertarian framework. And yes, it's a white supremacist neoliberal framing of food and sustainability when you publicly admit, once again, like I said before, that you aren't really concerned about black moms in the inner city struggling to feed their children. Because hey, they don't have buying power like white soccer moms. And this is exactly what Salatin um, so that was kind of one of the things I wanted to share with you in a chapter in progress in my book. Um, let me just check the timing. Which time do I have? Okay. I think I have a few more minutes because my talk is like 11.30, 11.45. And then there'll be room for questions. Um, so after I just kind of share these little vignettes with you, and I actually appreciate that you sitting, um, uh, this listening to what will eventually become uh, a more cogent um, book, hopefully published at the end of uh, this year, um, is what your thoughts are about um, you know, white fragility and how you deal with these um, issues of systemic racism, or any other isms in the ethical foodscape. Uh, most people I think are attending are vegetarian or vegans. Um, and how do you deal with this? Um, and how do you deal with the fact that so many people have this good intention but if you don't have a literacy around intersectionality and how to alleviate systems of oppression, although you're a well-intended good person, good vegan, that your impact could potentially be negative. And though my focus is mostly on um, white racialized privileged subjects, this can, you know, also be um, a, this can also be something that those in other privileged spheres can think about. Um, so my question I guess, to the audience is, how do you navigate the spaces if you're doing activist work as someone who's part of a marginalized group, getting, you know, you could be getting white fragility as a response, and you could also be getting um, fragility around maybe, you know, white cisgender men who don't want to talk about um, the impact that their cisgender status have on power. Um, also, people who are ableist, so if you're doing disability rights work, and then you encounter people who are able-bodied privileged, and you're trying to do that work, how do you uproot um, able-bodied fragility? Or um, even more interesting, if you're doing the work of anti-speciesism, veganism, how do you navigate spaces where there's a lot of omnivorous fragility? So those kind of the questions I have for the audience. Um, and how you've been able to navigate or kind of work through um, spaces in which um, people are just in great denial and their responses are anger and rage and ritual um, versus them just being more open to the possibility that, you know what, even though I'm a well-intended person, I guess the lack of understanding of raw my privileges in the system um, actually causes me to actually produce more harm than I realize. So that's the questions that I want to kind of leave with the audience and you can also feel free to ask me questions thanks thank you so much dr harper does anyone have any questions And if, if 
someone can, because I didn't get through all the slides, um, if someone can go through to, all the way to the end, my last slide has my um, contact information if people have more questions. Hello, Dr. Harper. Um, my name is Gerald. Um, I didn't really have much of an intention of being here this today. It was my mum who brought me here. I'm not vegan. I am not anything but um, kind of normalized in my in my diet. Um, I didn't have any, um, I guess, real objective, you know, to kind of get anything from your talk. It was, as I said, I was led here just for being from my mother, and I was just kind of thinking, like, you should be entirely encouraged by the fact that you're kind of on your own pilgrimage in trying to extrapolate, you know, you know, oppress the oppressive nature of being a black woman in modern times in America, but also it's kind of um, a globalized issue, you know, where there seems to be, you know, th the color line in America is so thick and it's so obvious um, to, to kind of the naked eye what takes place overseas you know, to do with racism, to do with oppression, to do with um, there just being kind of a lack of a, of a, um, I guess, an integration, you know, with the mindset of just like, how do we overcome our issues as one people, so black people, but also trying to assimilate with, you know, the ideas that perhaps Martin Luther King brought together. Um, and it's interesting because I, I Again, like I'm at a point in my life, just as a, bl a black man in the UK, where I'm kind of questioning my own identity. I'm questioning things about gentrification. I'm questioning things about living in in a society where, or in a city where, kind of <laughs> expenses are running at an all-time high, and just not being able to kind of get onto any onto the social ladder, which I thought I would have been on, you know, when I had left school. But also, like, kind of looking at myself and what I've kind of haven't completed as a human being, you know, my shortcomings as a person and as a black person in comparison to my white counterpart, you know? So, like, at, this, at the same time, like, I know this is, I'm probably harping on a bit here, but like, I'm, I'm right now I'm kind of doing a course at the BFI, um, the British Film Institute, for anyone who's interested, and it's an extrapolating black cinema and, and the kind of, um, the, <laughs> modal influences of, of cinema from early 1900s through, through to now and the representation of black peoples and black skin and black identity throughout you know the, the course and we've extrapolated American cinema now we've just done Nollywood and, and African cinema and you know discussing North and African North South and West and East um, cinema and it's just like this kind of gorgeous you know course amongst white and black and just kind of seeing how everybody reacts to such um, an expansive topic which includes us all whether it's by you know the shades of our skin as black people or the or white people in the audience who are kind of seeing it from an alternate view so like to just go back just be encouraged by what you're on right now because you are almost single-handedly you are you know, giving a, um, you're, you're on your own march, but it's not a march that you are on in singularity. You know, it, you're doing something which is worth it, and to, and to the end, you know, you have to be kind of doing that for the longer course and not for the short course. You're on a long tail course, and we can all identify with it. I think white, black, Asian, whatever, like, Everyone has, you know, something that they go through with their people, but also that they're going through, we're going through holistically. So perhaps that's not the most coherent question or oh, answer, but I that's like kind of what, I'm, mm -hmm. what I kind of felt, because I, I sat here for the past 45 minutes and I've locked into your, your talk and I, and I thought I would have drifted off, but like, for me, it was the most engaging, one of the most engaging talks that, you know, I've heard in a while, so keep going, sister. Well, thank you, because I was, I'm still trying not to fall asleep since it's so early, so. I thank you for um, letting me know that it was um, captivating and um, cogent enough <laughs> um, for you to connect to. So thank you, thank you. And I know um, when I I know change doesn't happen overnight. So um, I've 
kind of given up on that because that will cause lots of frustration and suffering. So I kind of do what I do because I feel like it's right. And whether the change happens in my lifetime or not, it's just something that I'm not holding on to, but I'm just doing it because it's right. But they're all, it's very frustrating at times, but that's something my father had taught me a long time ago. You just, you just do it because it's right, not because you actually expect sudden change overnight or even your lifetime. So, so it's good to kind of hear you and talk about your own experiences as well and connecting it to the diaspora, African diaspora that there are, you know, um, similar struggles throughout the diaspora and that we're all kind of linked, even though it seems like a lot of us are kind of far away, but that the struggles are, are linked and it's, it's, it's similar. So thank you. Other questions? Anyone about this talk, about any other things that you've read from Dr. Therese Harper? Yes. Hey, Breeze, this is Lauren. I thought it was you. It's hard for <laughs> me to say, but I see, but I can see when Just you walked in. Like, <laughs> I like did. Like Just want to thank you for everything you do and looking forward to your next book coming out, and I'm sure you promoted your books. Um, you know, maybe if someone can go back one, from the information that's on the PowerPoint, if you go back one slide, there's a book cover. So thanks for reminding me. I often forget Thank to promote you. those things. <laughs> thanks. Great. And she well, also has a I Patreon page if people are interested in supporting her work, if she didn't already mention that as well. No, I didn't, but thanks for reminding me. Um, that's what we do. <laughs> thanks. So if you're interested in supporting that book, um, if someone can go to the last slide again, um, I don't think I have that information up, but if you email me, um, I can email you the details and I'm just upfront like the work I do is um, I'm a independent scholar I don't actually have a postdoc or professor job so I'm very limited in my funding and um, I have three kids which is whenever I want to do the work I have to put them in some type of child care um, so that type of support the patreon support um, allows me to kind of you know get this book published faster um, so my fans and people who support my work um, can have more tools to figure out this concept of intersectionality within the ethical foodscape. So thanks, Lauren, for reminding people of that. Great. Any last questions? Hi, Dr. Harper. It's wonderful to, to be here at your talk. I'm a huge fan of your work, so it's, it's I'm, I'm from California, so I understand it's three in the morning and I, I feel really <laughs> bad, so thank you for doing this for us. Um, one thing I was just wondering that you sort of touched on tangentially and I've really struggled with within the vegan movement is um, this idea, you know, how you're talking about kind of post-racism and the idea that because you're vegan, you don't need to think about these issues and how that manifests itself in a lot of cultural appropriation and just um, whiteness being seen as, you know, not really anything that needs to be critiqued so then we can kind of pick and choose these other perhaps more ex quote unquote exciting um, fact, you know, facets of other, other identities and not really thinking critically about that and that I found it's, it can be a real struggle to engage with people about that um, and question whether that's an okay thing to do. So I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about, you know, how best to approach that or resources or things like that. Okay, yeah, actually I do. So if you actually, because like I don't have all the resources on top of my head, uh, but if you email me at the address or anyone, I have a little toolkit that I put together um, that's more focused on addressing like whiteness and racism and like um, resources on how to do that. So if you email me, uh, but you can also um, apply that to many other isms that are difficult to broach um, within the vegan movement because I feel like systemic racism is not the only problem. <laughs> There's like lots of problems. Uh, but if you email me, um, I can um, help you with resources that um, talk about how to facilitate difficult discussions about race and whiteness um, and how to turn around potentially disastrous like um, uh, dialogues into moments of opportunity and learning. So um, if you email me that, I can send you a, the, the list to kind of help you along with that. Um, but if there's no guarantee because there are a lot of people who are educated to know in their minds that certain things are wrong, morally wrong, legally wrong. Um, and my biggest challenge has been how do you make the heart change? So 
Um, and hopefully the, this toolkit can kind of help, you know, like I said, there's no guarantee, but if you email me, I can send you the resources that I send people to kind of help them with those challenging moments. Cause there isn't enough, at least in my education, I never really got the, how you facilitate it. I get all of the information about, you know, how systemic isms work, but how do you get to the point where you can actually facilitate, um, conversations and dialogues that enable people who are in deep denial or have fears around what it means for them to be outed about their privileges. Um, how can we, you know, get to the next step where people are actually actively um, engaging and engaging in self-reflexivity um, around those privileges and then taking action to actually become allies in solidarity. So hopefully um, that toolkit that I send to people will help with those stages. Thanks. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. It was wonderful hearing you speak. Another round of applause for Dr. Harper, please. Thank you. And I'll, I'll try to go back to bed before my three, five, and seven year olds wake up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, get some rest. So, but thank you very much. And, um, you know, just uh, the last slide, I believe, has all my information. So, contact me if you have questions. I remember if I don't respond immediately, it's because I have three kids and I probably went into labor. Um, but I will get back to you, like I usually do, in the next few weeks. And, and I really am grateful for your questions because they help make my work even better and stronger when people have their comments and their questions. Okay. Great. Oh, thank you. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs>